You're listening to the I'm Busy Being Awesome podcast with Paula Angabretson, episode number 233. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, episode 233. How are you? So this episode comes out the second week of January 2024, which is pretty darn wild <laughs> to say out loud. I hope this year is, frankly, kicking off in the exact way you hoped. And if it's not, I hope that you're being super gentle with yourself and that you can remind yourself of one of my very favorite phrases, which is, this is the part where, dot, 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 and then you describe exactly what's happening. So this is the part where everyone in the house is sick and we're doing the best we can, which is literally what we're navigating here. <laughs> uh, or this is the part where I'm struggling to transition from the holiday season to new year energy or whatever it is that you might be navigating right now use that thought if it's supportive for you this is the part where and then put in what is actually happening now this time of year can be quite loaded with a lot of emotion for us adhd brains you know i know some of us are really quite all in on setting big goals and setting big resolutions while others of us are not so much <laughs> and always it's a continuum right most of us fall somewhere in between the completely all in and the complete rejection of goals and habits and resolutions now i tend to love the fresh start energy of the new year especially when it's done with intention especially when we do this with some real thought ahead of time so that we're not just making completely unreasonable plans for the robot version of ourselves to do quote unquote all the things instead i love it when we can really approach this fresh start with a sense of clarity this feeling of groundedness as we consider what would it look like to use these goals and use these plans as a way to support ourselves and our adhd brains in the future how can we hook our future selves up? You know, what would make me look back and think, heck yeah, past self, thank you for doing this. I'm so glad you chose this goal and you leaned in. That's exactly what I needed, right? I love when we can step into the new year energy from that stance. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I do like to choose a word or a theme for the year as one of those kind of grounding touch points that really helps me to stay centered and focused throughout the year. And this year, my word, or rather my theme, is be still. It's not one word, but two. So be still. Now, this is very different from any other word I have ever chosen in all the years I've been doing this work. For example, some of my past year's words were uh, all in, courage, joy, committed, possibility. So this year, on the total other end of the spectrum, I am grounding myself in the reminder to be still. And I think this is going to be quite the challenge and adventure for me to say the least, which is a little ironic to think about when I'm contemplating stillness. But nevertheless, <laughs> that is what I'm doing. And as a side note, if you are interested in choosing your word of the year, if you haven't gotten around to that, but you've been kind of interested in exploring it, I have a free workbook and it walks you step by step through the process. I will link to it in the show notes, or you can head to my website, I'mBusyBeingAwesome.com. Just search for the word of the year workbook in the search bar. It's going to pop right up. So with that all in mind... <laughs> This topic of the new year and fresh starts and guiding words and themes and resolutions, all of these things have me thinking about failing and more specifically, the importance of planning to fail. Now, this might sound a bit strange. You may be thinking, wait, what? Isn't it kind of a bad idea to focus on failing, Paula? <laughs> and if you're thinking that, good on you. This is not my usual MO, but today, I want to take this idea of planning to fail and turn it on its head just a bit. So when we think about planning to fail, I think about it in two ways, one of which is supportive, one of which is really not. So the first approach that most of us tend to unintentionally take is when we consider a goal or a big project or, you know, living into our word of the year, and we think to ourselves something like, well, I sure hope 
it works this year. Honestly, I'm not quite sure why I even try this. I never really stick with anything. Anyway, I'll probably just fail, but let's try. Or, you know, we'll see how long this lasts. <laughs> so in other words, we kind of enter the entire process assuming that we're ultimately going to fail. So in a sense, we fail ahead of time because we don't really set a goal at all or we choose something that's completely unrealistic or we don't really pause to work through what supports we might need to set ourselves up for success in the long run. Now, this is not the type of planning to fail we're going to talk about today. The planning to fail that I want to explore with all of you today is about the power of anticipating things that will inevitably go quote unquote wrong as you work toward your goal or you lean into your theme for the year and then intentionally planning what you want to do to work through those challenges that will inevitably come up. So we are literally planning for those fails in order to have an action plan in place to support you through the obstacles and keep you moving forward. So today, we are going to, first of all, intentionally decide what we want failure to mean. Then we're going to talk about how we can effectively plan to fail. And then we'll explore some specific action steps and examples so you can plan to fail in your life in a way that's supportive of you and your goals. That is a soundbite right there. So you can plan to fail in your life. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the definition of failure according to Merriam-Webster because... I love a good definition. Failure is a, quote, lack of success or, quote, a falling short. Okay? Failure is a lack of success or a falling short. Please notice that none of these definitions say anything about your flawed character or your worth as a human or whether or not you are, quote, unquote, good enough. Failure simply means a lack of success in something or a falling short of something. Here's the deal. You can make those definitions mean so many different things. Sure, you could make it mean all the painful things we usually do, like we aren't good enough, we didn't try hard enough, we should have tried harder, we never follow through, we can never reach our goals. But be honest with yourself, how's that working out for you? <laughs> Is that working? I got to tell you, it doesn't work for me. So alternatively, what would it be like if we shifted that perspective? So for example, what would it be like to start collecting your failures from a sense of accomplishment. What if you were proud of every single time you failed because you know that you are intentionally learning from each failure? If you try something and you fall short of your initial expectation, but you get curious and you explore what worked and what didn't and what you can learn and what you want to do differently next time, and you try again, in a word, you lean into the process of iteration, which is something I was just exploring in We're Busy Being Awesome, my small group coaching program, this idea of iteration and learning from what worked and learning from what didn't and trying again by making adjustments. When you can lean into that process of iteration, you grow so fast. You learn so much. I am telling you, you will amaze yourself time and time again at how quickly you move forward. And ultimately reach that end goal because you're willing to try and fail and learn so much faster than someone who isn't. Or on the other hand, if that option doesn't land with you, you could also decide, okay, well, if failure means the lack of success or falling short, and I haven't yet reached the goal, even if I'm past the original timeline, it doesn't mean I failed. It just means I haven't reached the goal yet. I'm not done yet. Don't change the goal, change the timeline, change the deadline. You haven't failed, you're still working on it. I love that phrase, you're either winning or you're learning. You're either winning or you're learning. You can only fail if you quit. So first and foremost, I really encourage you to redefine what you want failure to mean in your mind. Remember that failing means absolutely nothing about you as a person or your character or your inherent worth, which is at 100% at all times, okay? Failing is simply falling short of your expectation or you weren't successful at creating or reaching whatever benchmark you set at a specific time. That's okay. It happens. I think I've mentioned the quote at some point on this podcast that success is built on a pile of failures. This is so spot on. If we are intentional about it, 
If we are intentional about our fails, we learn so much more. We learn so much more from failure than if we simply win all the time because we need to slow down and see what's working and what's not. Plus, when we can be intentional about what worked and what didn't and provide ourselves that gift of reflection, we never actually fail. We're just learning and growing until we inevitably reach success because the only time you can actually fail is if you quit. The rest is just the messy middle on the way to success. So if that's true, then it's even more important that we intentionally create plans to fail ahead of time. Of course, things are going to get in the way. Of course, things will be hard. Let's plan for when that happens. So how do we do that? How do we plan to fail so that we can keep going? Well, first things first, think about the goal that you've chosen or the habit you want to establish or the resolution that you've set, okay? Before we think about any kind of plans we want to create, I encourage you first to think about that goal or plan or resolution or habit and get a piece of paper and a pen or open up the notes app on your phone and start identifying all of the doubt, all of the whispers, all of the loud shouts of doubt that your brain is offering that you can't do it. Make a note of what's tripped you up in the past and what you're worried might happen again or what might get in the way this time. Basically, you're going to list every single concern, every past stumbling block, every worry that your brain in its ever imaginative state has conjured up. Some of the things you list might be pretty general. Some of the things might be super specific and practical. So here's some general examples, okay? Your brain might offer thoughts like procrastination's going to trip me up. Now, maybe you found yourself procrastinating in the past when you were facing a really big project or goal and you noticed that the fear of not completing it on time or the fear that it's not going to be good enough kept you from finishing. So you saw that, you learned from that, and so we're going to create some plans for that, okay? Or overwhelm. Maybe the sheer magnitude of a specific goal or project left you feeling incredibly overwhelmed. You got stuck in paralysis by the size of the task at hand. And so you didn't know where to start and it was too hard to break it down and you didn't work on it. Okay. It's happened to all of us. Not a problem. Let's identify it. Let's recognize it. Maybe it's distractions. Okay, external distractions, the constant pull of social media, the allure of whatever it is you've been streaming night after night, whatever it is that could derail your focus in the past, maybe you're worried that that's going to happen again. Maybe it's self-doubt, you know, that nagging voice that's always questioning your capability, your worth, that might have held you back in the past, kept you playing small, and you're worried that that's going to happen again. Maybe you're worried about a lack of motivation. This one comes up a lot when I coach with clients. You know, we've all had those moments when your brain is just so bored of doing the same old project and you want the next new idea. You want the new thing instead because you can't seem to generate the motivation you need to stick with it. And so you're worried, well, if I start and I lose motivation, then what? Or maybe it's a fear of failure. There is a very real fear that even with your best efforts, you might fall short, which could trigger this sense of failure and a whole bunch of emotions that tend to come with that definition. Okay, so these are all different general obstacles your brain might include on your list. You might not have all of them, you might have different ones, but those are some. Now you might also have kind of practical things on your list, like competing demands on your time. You have a finite amount of time each day, and when your daughter's sick and you can't get to your tap class, or you can't stay late at work, your brain loves to offer all or nothing thinking. And so you throw in the towel, right? So your brain might be thinking, oh, but what about those times when my daughter's sick? Or what about the times when my boss needs this immediately? I can't do it then, so I can't do it at all. Or maybe you have specific skill gaps that are keeping you from taking action. You know, maybe you're facing a, a literal skill gap. So if you're in a growth year in your business, for example, and you want to get into running Facebook ads, you may have a specific skill gap where you need to learn how to run Facebook ads. And perhaps in the past, that lack of knowledge, right, just a skill that you haven't learned yet, made you stop rather than lean in and figure out a solution. So these are all just different examples to help your brain start identifying what might get in the way for you because it's so important to pause and identify those obstacles. And we want to do that before they happen. 
because then we can start creating plans to navigate them. When we bring these concerns into the light, we see them for what they are. They're just obstacles to navigate. That's it. You've totally navigated obstacles before, right? It's not a problem. And the way that I love to plan for these obstacles is by creating if-then plans. So essentially, these plans act as a roadmap for your ADHD brain, and it, they provide these clear instructions whenever we veer off course. So they help prevent our brain from slipping into complete all or nothing thinking and throwing in the towel when we have an off day or an off week or an off month when we're working toward our goals. They give our brain direction. They help us quickly get back on track, which helps us continue making that forward progress we want. And these if then plans sound a bit like this. If I find myself procrastinating on the work project on Tuesday morning, then I will break it down into smaller steps using the Magic To Do app. Or if I'm having a hard time transitioning into work and I notice I'm avoiding it, then I will hop on a body double with my colleague or I'll head to a co-working space to give myself that additional support. Or if I notice clutter piling up at home, then for the following week, I will set an alarm for 15 minutes each day after work to focus on one area of one room to declutter. And I'm going to continue that for the whole week. So again, we're planning to fail, but we're doing it intentionally. We're doing it to help us get right back on track. And as we talked about a few weeks ago in episode 231, our ADHD brains crave some level of structure and routine. We all want some level of structure. And by intentionally designing these if-then plans with our brain in mind, we offer exactly that. Now, by planning to fail and creating if-then plans, we provide ourselves a safety net for when distractions inevitably come up or we lose our motivation or our executive functions simply don't show up for the day or the week. When we have these plans in place, you're not just relying on sheer willpower. You're setting up this fail-safe system. So for those of you who like analogies, like me, imagine your brain as a tightrope walker. Okay, If you go to the circus, you'll see that the tightrope walkers, high up there in the air, walking on this rope, they always have a safety net below them. Okay, If-then plans are that safety net for us when we're working toward our really big goals. They catch you before you fall too far, and they guide you right back to the tightrope. So how do we do this? How do we establish our if-then plans? I'm going to talk about three simple steps. So the first step is to identify the obstacles. Okay, so we want to do a thought download, like I mentioned earlier, of everything that might get in the way of you reaching your goal. Think about the big things, the small things, the everyday obstacles. Consider specific situations. Consider particular emotions. Maybe it's boredom or fear or worry that might get in your way. Write all of that down. That's step one. Then we get to step two, where we are going to craft specific responses. So once you've pinpointed those potential pitfalls, we're going to design precise responses with our if-then plan. If X happens, then I will do Y. And we want to make these responses super actionable and tailored to your unique obstacle. And then we get to step three, which might sound strange, but stick with me, which is to visualize yourself following through on that if-then plan. Visualize that success. Because when you envision yourself successfully navigating those obstacles and using those if-then plans, it helps to enhance your commitment to the plan and increase the likelihood of sticking with it. So let's talk about some of these in action. Let's talk about some examples of what these if-then plans look like. How might we integrate them into our lives, whether we're working toward a professional goal or we're creating a decluttered space or we're prioritizing specific relationships this year. Let's look at how we can do this because when we create specific if-then plans, they serve as a compass. They guide us through the roadblocks. So for example, in We're Busy Being Awesome this week, I was coaching somebody on launching their podcast. So in this situation, let's say one of the potential pitfalls that we anticipate as we're working toward getting that podcast out there are creative blocks. Okay, these come up often for anybody in a creative space. And so normally, 
let's say we face a creative block and then we feel really discouraged and we stop working, right? We do something that our brain is more familiar with. We fold laundry, we check email, we go do something like that. So in a situation like this, maybe we create different if-then plans to navigate when creative blocks inevitably show up because they will when we're in a creative space. So if I hit a creative block and I notice myself clicking through a bunch of tabs and reaching for my phone rather than outlining my podcast episode, then I will take a 10 minute break and go for a walk around the block to clear my mind. Or if I find myself staring at a blank screen and struggling to generate new ideas for the podcast, then I will lean into my visual learning style and I will create a mind map to visually explore the different themes and potential episode angles. Or if I catch myself overthinking and second guessing my podcast content, then I will set a timer for 15 minutes and I will practice a stream of conscious writing exercise just to free up my thoughts a bit. Or if I catch myself comparing my podcast ideas to others and feeling inadequate, then I will consciously redirect my focus to my audience. And I'm going to remind myself that it's not about me. It's about the people whom I can help. Here's another example. Let's think about maintaining a decluttered space. Maybe you gifted yourself support to actually declutter your house this winter or something, but now you're worried about the inevitable clutter creep with extra stuff that can come back into the house. So in a situation like this, you might create some if-then plans, like if I notice new items accumulating, then I will implement my one in one out rule to ensure that you know, every new item I bring in, I will remove an existing item. Or if I find myself tempted to buy or bring home new stuff that could contribute to the clutter, then I will pause to make sure I know exactly where I'm going to store that item so I know it has a specific home. Or if I notice specific areas becoming a gathering space for clutter, for me, that's usually my kitchen island, <laughs> then I will schedule regular maintenance sessions where I dedicate a specific time to review and declutter these areas each week or each month as needed. Or maybe you're focused on developing specific relationships or friendships this year. Let's say you've been uh, really busy over the past couple of years with your family and your work and your personal friendships have kind of taken the back burner, but this season you want to shift that. And so you created a goal of connecting with at least one friend per week or something. So in this situation, you might create if then plans like if I find myself overwhelmed or too busy with work or personal commitments and I'm not checking in with my friends, then I will schedule a recurring weekly walk and talk in my calendar to prioritize and protect time for those connections that I want. And I can move that time, I can add more time as well, but this helps ensure that there's time when I can either walk and talk with a friend in person if we live in the same area, or we can call one another and talk on the phone while we're out walking together, okay? Or if I notice a lapse in communication with a friend and I start feeling that hesitation to reach out, you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's been so long and now it feels weird and then it gets longer. If that happens, then I will set a reminder each week to send a quick message, whether it's a text or a voice note or a meme, to let them know I'm thinking of them and I will let that be enough. If I sense my friendships are taking a backseat to other priorities, then I will create a fun list of activities or outings that I'd love to do with the people in my circle. And I will actively work toward checking one of them off each week or every two weeks. So again, the key is to adapt these if-then plans to your unique goals and obstacles and preferences. Because when we can proactively address what might get in the way of your goals, you put up that safety net. And that helps ensure that if you slip, you have a soft landing and it's so much easier to get back on track. So that is what I have for you today. I hope that you take what resonates with you and you run with it. Remember, you get to choose what failure means. And I'm here to suggest that we redefine it. Failure does not mean anything about you as a person. It's not a character flaw or a reflection of your worth. It is an opportunity to learn and grow because you're either winning or you're learning. Failure only happens if you quit. And even then you get to decide what you think about that. 
as you approach your goals and your projects and your habits and your resolutions, I encourage you to plan to fail, but do it with intention. Anticipate the obstacles that will inevitably get in the way. List every doubt, stumbling block, worry, anything that comes up. Consider the big and small obstacles, the specific situations, the emotions that might keep you stuck. Then remind your brain that these obstacles are just challenges to navigate. They are not insurmountable barriers. And we can do that by crafting specific responses. By using the if-then model, we can design precise responses for each obstacle. If this happens, then I will do that. Make your responses small and actionable and tailored to your unique situation. And then finally, visualize your success. Envision yourself successfully navigating these challenges to help strengthen your commitment to sticking to your plan. All right, my friends, that's going to do it for us this week. And if you're ready to take these concepts deeper and apply them to your life, if you're ready to learn how to support your ADHD in a way that works for you, I invite you to check out today's show notes or head to imbusybeingawesome.com slash group to learn more about my small group coaching program, We're Busy Being Awesome. If it sounds like a great fit for you, you can add your name to the wait list and you'll be the first to know when the next cohort opens. Also, have you grabbed the word of the year workbook? It is a powerful support to help you create clarity for the year ahead, stay grounded and centered whenever unexpected situations or plot twists arise in your life. You can grab it now through the show notes or head to imbusybeingawesome.com and search for word of the year workbook. Until next time, keep being awesome. I'll talk with you soon.